Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful that we can just come to the Lord in prayer and all we have to do is ask Him? Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful that's all it requires? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. With the Lord's help, David, you can go ahead and start the video if you hadn't already. I want you to get your Bibles and we're just going to read one very simple passage of Scripture. And I, I'm pretty sure it's on the screen. I'm, I'm, if you will forgive me, I may, I may be nursing a bottle of water most of the day and I may sound kind of nasally. I did have a little bout with pneumonia toward the end of the week, but thank God for amoxicillin. Uh, it does dry me up a little bit, so if I sound a little weird, just blame it on the antibiotic, okay? Uh, but uh, let's pray I don't get winded. Uh, so pray for the preacher this morning. But I want you to get your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 18. And we're going to continue in our our sermon series we started last week about make room. And while you're finding your scripture, um, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to pray. And if you uh, are able to, lay one hand on your heart, stretch one hand this way as we get ready to prepare for the word. Father, thank you this morning for the people in this building. God, I count it an honor and a privilege to be the chosen shepherd of this flock. Lord, I love these people. And I pray that God, you will let that love emanate from me and that God, you will let them hear this message from a heart of love this morning. God, I pray that you would let them has, have ears to hear and hearts to receive, that they would be good soil this morning so that the Word could be planted and rooted in their life and that it can bear 30, 60, and 100 fold return. Father, this morning hide me behind your cross. God, I plead the blood over my mind. I plead the blood over my lips. God, I ask for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be upon everything I do and say today so that, Lord, it can bring about some eternal value you in our lives. I praise you, Lord, for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I started a sermon series on make room and what this was birthed out of is I felt like uh, and I was impressed by the Lord to make this theme for my life this year and this church make, making room for more in 2024. And I told you what I'm asking God for and I'm asking God for more anointing, I'm asking God for, for more power, I'm asking God for more provision, I'm asking God for more in this church, more signs and wonders and miracles. I'm believing for Him to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I truly believe that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those of us that love Him. I do believe that God is about to bring us into a season of more, but before He does that in our personal lives and in the life of this church, we've got to make some preparations. We talked about it last week. We have to first make God this the number one priority in our life. And we start by by seeking first the kingdom of God. Okay, he's got to be first. He's got to be number one in our life. If he's not number one, then guess what? Nothing else is going to fall into place. But he said, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added unto you. That means everything else will find its place. That means you don't have to worry this morning if he's number one in your life. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, God wants to do more in our lives. He wants to exceed our expectations. He wants to do the impossible. He wants to accomplish these things that we didn't think were be able to be done. But God says He wants to do those things, but we have to make room for Him to do it. Last week we talked about making room for God through His Word. And we talked about making the Word a priority in our lives and filling our hearts and our lives so that the Word of God could dwell in us richly. I challenged you last week and I told you I remember who raised their hands and I do. How many of you kept with it this week and read your Bible at least 15 minutes a day? That's about all the hands. How many of you saw that it made a difference? How many of you are going to continue to do it? Okay, that's one thing I want to preface all of what I'm going to talk about over the next month or so. This is not something to be done just while we're in the sermon series. Amen. Don't read your word just 15 minutes until Drake's done with make room and then we move on to something else and you move on from your Bible study. Amen. Hello, this is, this is establishing a priority, establishing a routine for the rest of this year and for the rest of your life. Okay. Amen. 
So we talked about the Word, and this morning, and this is actually going to be a part two message, I had so much that even today's notes are 11 pages long, and I thought, dear God, if I keep going, they'll be here all morning. So we're going to make this a part two, but this morning we're going to talk about making room for God through prayer. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, He spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Okay, so let me establish this first before I get into any, anything else. Prayer should be part of your life. Amen. This did not say that Jesus suggested that men pray. This said that men ought, all, ought to pray. One translation says men ought always to pray. That means that it was a commandment. It is a command for God's people to pray. And there's a reason why it's a commandment, a reason why God wants it to be in our lives. The Bible has a lot to say about prayer. Whether you understand it or realize it or not, the Bible itself is a catalog of prayers. The word prayer and its derivations are mentioned somewhere close to 700 plus times. And then throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, prayer is active. And it is being used to change the course of individual lives and histories. Abraham prayed and God birthed a nation through a barren woman. Moses prayed and God split the Red Sea. Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. Hannah prayed and God brought forth the prophet Samuel. David prayed and God slew the giant Goliath. Elijah prayed and fire fell from heaven. Elijah Elisha prayed and a dead boy was brought back to life. Hezekiah prayed and his life was extended 15 years. Daniel prayed and God shut the mouths of the lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed and he delivered them out of the fiery furnace. Zechariah prayed and his wife Elizabeth brought forth John the Baptist. The church prayed in the upper room and the Holy Ghost fell and the church was born. Peter and John prayed and the lame man at the gate called beautiful got up and walked. The early church prayed while Peter was in prison and the angel opened the gates and let Peter out of the jailhouse. The apostle John was in the presence on the Lord's day on the Isle of Patmos praying to the Father and he got the revelation of Jesus Christ and wrote what we now know as the book of Revelation. Can I tell you something this morning? Prayer is powerful. Prayer is able to accomplish the impossible. Prayer is able to do the unimaginable. Prayer changes things. Prayer alters history. Prayer changes the trajectory of men and women's life. Prayer is powerful and prayer changes things. The great theologian on prayer, E.M. Bounds, said all things can be accomplished by prayer. See, Scripture has a great deal to say about prayer and the necessity of it in our lives. But here's the sad reality. When we consider the presence of prayer in our lives, it is the most inactive spiritual discipline. According to Pew Research done just this past year, 48% of Christians admit to praying every day. 84% admit that they pray occasionally, mostly once to twice a week. And 38% admit that they never pray. The number of those who pray every day, 48%, has dropped 5% from 2021. Do you know what that tells me? Prayer is no longer essential to us. I hope you wore your steel toe boots today. Prayer is no longer a priority. The church... Every church, the church itself, the 120 were praying in the upper room and the church was born through prayer. The church of God was born through prayer. This church right here was born through prayer of seven individuals, but yet the church doesn't pray. The church used to, the biggest, the second largest attendance that they have was the prayer meeting. Brother Philip, I'm sure you remember the days where Sunday was big, but the prayer meeting almost exceeded the Sunday morning crowd. Yeah. But can I tell you, the last time we had a prayer meeting here on Sunday night, on Monday night, there's five of us. Me, Taylor, Misty, Betty, and Paige. That was it. Let that sink in for a minute. The prayer meeting, the prayers which built the church, now... We don't do it anymore. It's not a priority. If the church has a prayer meeting, nobody comes. Prayer's not essential to us. 
Prayer is not important to us anymore. Christians pray when they feel like it on Sundays or Wednesdays or when they need something. See, Muslims pray five times a day. Hindus pray six times a day. Jews pray three times a day. And Christians pray when they want or when they need something. <laughs> it's sad that other pagan religions have beat us when it comes to prayer. It's sad that the Muslim prays to his false god Allah more than we pray to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's sad that the Hindus pray to their conglomeration of goddesses and goddesses who are nothing but demons when we pray less to Jesus. See, prayer no longer holds a priority in our life that it once did. It's become stigmatized in the church. It's a taboo practice that we only talk about when necessary. See, prayer has become a secondary thought. It's a secondary thought that is only to be utilized when every other resource has been exhausted. See, we have strayed from the place of prayer. We've lost the art of praying. And because we have strayed from prayer, we've strayed from God. I'm amazed when some people come to me and they're going through something. I can't tell you how many times that this sentence has left their lips. Brother Drake, I just feel like God is a million miles away. I feel like I can't find him. I feel like he's nowhere to be found. And I understand that, that, that problem. I've been there. And I know that many times that problem comes from the fact that we are, we're waiting on God to do something and he hadn't done it yet. And we wonder if and when he's ever going to do it. But I have also had encounters with people who said that sentence. And after questioning them a little bit, I found that while they're going through a problem, they hadn't even prayed about it. Sure. And if they prayed about it, they prayed about it once and left it alone. My question always is, is how do you expect God to be involved in something when you haven't invited him in? Amen. How do you expect God to feel close when you haven't drawn close to him through prayer? See, what I know is God knows your need. He knows what your problem is this morning, but he will not interject himself where he is not invited. See, God is a gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to force his power on you. He wants you to invite him in. See, all we have to do when God feels far away is pray because God is only as far away as your prayer. God is only as far away as your prayer. James 4, 8 said, if you will draw near unto God, he will draw near unto you. If you will just call upon his name, all you got to do is call him. And when you call him, he will come near. Amen. See, all we have to do is ask him. James 4 and 2 said, you have not because you ask not. See, here's what I believe. This is partly why I feel like God has birthed this theme in my life this year and in this church is because I believe there are things God really wants to do. Yes. I believe there are some great things God wants to do, but I feel like God has been wanting to do them, but we miss them because we haven't prayed. Yes. Yep. You mean just get honest with you? I believe this church could be bigger than it is right now, and it would be if we just pray about it. Amen. Yeah. I believe that we could be busting at the seams. Yeah. I believe your life could be overflowing with things that God wants to do, but it's not because you haven't prayed about yeah. it. That's right. Come on. Now, That's right. I do know that there are things in our heart, there's things in my heart that are so big for us, Holly, we're intimidated by them. If I was to ask you and really dig at you right now, there's a really big thing you want God to do in your life and in your family, but it's so big you're afraid to pray about it. Amen, amen. You're afraid to ask him for it. Why? Because it feels impossible for you. Yeah. But see, God wants to do the impossible in your life. God wants to do the impossible in this church. He wants to exceed your expectations and do more than what you can even imagine. But you have to ask him first. Yes. See, he said in Ephesians 3 and 23, that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask. Yes. See, asking is the baseline. Yes. 
Yes. That's the starting point. And so God wants to do exceedingly above what you ask. He doesn't want to just heal your body. He wants to heal you soul, mind, and body. He doesn't want to just save your son or daughter. He wants to save them and put them on the mission field to reach the lost people of this world. He doesn't just want to bless this church so we can be a hopping known church. He wants to bless us so we can keep other people from going to hell. God doesn't want to just do the bare minimum. He wants you to ask so that he can build upon that foundation and do exceedingly and abundantly above what you thought he could do. It's one of our favorite scriptures. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay? Yes. I believe there are God-given desires in every one of our hearts. Yes. I believe that these I'm going to pick on them because I sit on front. One of them's not here, but this one. She wants to get married. You want to know why? Because that's a God-given desire. The Lord said it is not good that man should be alone. That is a God-given desire to have a helpmate. It is my desire that my wife be healed and she is able to walk around and take care of our children. There are God-given desires in our heart. Another one is about this church. I long for the day that we have to knock out these walls and have a building program and start going into two services because we don't have the room to fill the people that are coming. But what I know is if God put the desire in our heart, he did it so that we would ask. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. He put that there so you would ask him for it because in your own ability it's not possible. But with God all things are possible. Right. Hallelujah. He said I believe that God puts desires in our hearts so that we will ask him but if you don't ask him, you don't even give him something to work with. Amen. If you don't ask him for it, then you are actually hindering God from doing the exceedingly and above, above what he wants to do. God wants to do more in your life. He wants to perform signs and wonders. He wants to give us the desires of our heart, but we have to learn to ask. Yes, amen. So we got to get to a place where we are not intimidated to ask him. We have to get to that place, as Hebrews said, that we come boldly before the throne of grace. I believe God wants to do more, but he's not going to do it until we ask him for more. Now, I want to make this preface before I go any further. I am not talking about, let's start this name it and claim it prosperity gospel mess. Okay, I'm not against any preacher, but I will tell you, I do believe that God wants us to prosper. John, first, first, second, or third John, I don't remember which one, said that God desires or said that he desires that we would prosper just as our soul would prosper, okay? But do you understand what prosperity really is according to the Bible? According to the Bible, prosperity just means to be successful. Yes. It doesn't mean that every one of us drive a Rolls Royce, live in a $2.5 million house, wear our money suits, and have all this gold and all this money we don't even know what to do with. No, prosperity means, guess what? I can pay my bills. My stomach's full. I've got a bed to sleep in. i got a roof over my head. i got a car and gas to drive, and I have got a job to go to. In my opinion, that's prosperity because I'm not living in the dirt. I've got some where to go. I'm thankful for the blessings of God. Yes. But asking God for more, I'm not asking God to give us more material things because in reality we've got more than what we know what to do with. Yes. See, we can have more stuff, but if we don't have more of Him, we're still spiritually bankrupt. Yes. See, I'm asking for more of God. And what I mean by that, and I have said this, to, and I will continue to say it till I am blue in the face. I want more of God, so much of Him, that we resemble the early church of Acts. That everywhere we go, signs and wonders follow us. That when we go to Walmart, we can lay hands on the clerk and they're healed. That when we go to the pick and save, we can witness to somebody and they get saved. When we go into the gas station, we can begin to just proclaim 
the goodness of God and God will begin to do miracles, signs and wonders through his church. Can I tell you God did not create us to live in the mully grubs and to live sullen and depressed and despaired. No, he meant for us to live lives empowered, lives of more than overcomers, more lives of more than conquerors. He wants us to walk in power. He wants us to walk in victory. He wants us to walk in the supernatural. But we can only have it if we have a prayer life. If you will read, I, I encourage every one of you, read the book of Acts this week in your 15 minute devotion and you will find every time something big happened, it was preceded with prayer. Yes, come on. Because prayer births the impossible. That's a tweetable moment right there. Prayer births the impossible. Do you hear me this morning? Yes. God wants to do more for Mercy Hill Church. He wants to do more for Philip and Lucy Pettis. He wants to do more for Sandy and Tommy Holt. He wants to do more for the Jackson family. But in order for him to do it, We've got to learn to ask him for it. Because when we ask him, we give him permission to start working. Are you with me this morning? We have to learn to ask. We've got to learn to get bold. Approach his throne boldly and ask him to do more. See, here's, here's my goal today. Today I just want to talk about prayer and the necessity of it in our lives. And I want to remove the stigma of prayer. Because you want to know why some of us haven't prayed this? Because it's been stigmatized. We don't look at prayer the way it really should be. We have looked at prayer through a jaded lens. And here's what I want to tell you. I want to dispel this lie that prayer is not a hardship. Prayer is not hard. That is the biggest lie the enemy tells you and me is that prayer is hard and that it is difficult and that it is impossible to achieve. Yeah. You may say, well, Brother Drake, prayer is hard. I get what you're saying. It's sometimes it's harder to pray than others. Yeah. It's harder to try and get that out. But, but and, 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 and when it comes down to the bare minimum of it, prayer is not hard. Prayer is not an impossible task. See, the enemy lies to us and tells us that prayer is hard. And because we think prayer is hard, we think we're failing at it. But can I tell you that prayer is only difficult when you think you're failing at it? The reason we think we're, we're, the reason we think we're not good at praying is because the enemy's told us we're not good at praying. The reason we don't think we can accomplish prayers is because the enemy just heaps these lies on us. Anybody ever heard him say this? Your prayers aren't effective. Amen. Come on. I don't know if he talks to you like he does me sometimes. But sometimes he'll tell me, why are you doing this? You're wasting your time. You're wasting your breath. He'll, he'll tell you and he'll beat you down. And he, he'll tell, he's told me, Amber, you don't pray like brother so-and-so. So what makes you think you're going to get a prayer through? And I'll compare myself and he'll say, you don't use this word. You don't do that. You don't pray like this. And before too long, he's beat us down and beat us down. And when we do go and try and pray, he tells us, Sister Carolyn, when we come out of prayer, we've struggled the whole time. He said, if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't struggle with prayer. He just lies and he condemns and, and we eventually believe him and we think we're failing. But can I tell you, the only way you can fail at prayer is not to do it. The only way you can be a failure at prayer is if you don't make the effort to try and pray. See, the enemy wants to make us think that prayer is some complicated mechanism that needs this part and this part and this factor and this factor. But can I tell you, the only, the only factor that successful prayer needs is action. That's all it needs. You want to be a successful prayer warrior? Just do it. Amen. Nike pinned the phrase before I did. Just do it. Just pray. That's all you got to do. All you got to do is pray. Take action and you can be a successful prayer warrior. Yes. Yes. See, here's two big lies and here's two things I want to help you expose about how prayer is a hardship. See, the only factor you need to have a successful prayer life is action. See, successful praying is not determined by time. Now, I am not saying that you don't have time. That's an excuse. Don't ever tell me I don't have time to pray. That's a lie from the pits of hell. If you've got time to watch your soap operas, if you've got time to flip through Facebook and 
TikTok and Instagram and, and gossip on the phone, then you've got time to go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. What I'm talking about is successful praying does not require a time allotment. There are people who will tell you that if you don't pray an hour to an hour and a half or 45 minutes or 30 minutes, that you're no good at prayer. I heard one minister say that God don't even start listening until we pray at least 30 minutes. And I used to live under that condemnation of thinking, Brother Philip, if I don't pray at least 30 minutes, then what am I doing? And I, put, I tethered myself to a religious routine and I, I, I dreaded going to prayer because I thought if I don't pray this much, then I've wasted my time. But can I tell you in the short amount of time that I've walked with the Lord, I've had a various time of prayer. I've once prayed for an hour. I've prayed for an hour and a half. I've prayed 45 minutes in the Holy Ghost. I've prayed off and on throughout the whole day. I've prayed in the car. I've prayed at the house. I've prayed in this altar. I've prayed outside. I've prayed 10 minutes. Then there's been times all I could do was utter the words, help me Jesus. Just three words. But can I tell you what I found to be true? No matter if I pray for an hour or no matter if I pray for a minute, every time I call on his name, he draws near. Every time I whisper the name of Jesus, I find him to be closer than a brother. Every time I just call on him, he is right there. It doesn't take this amount of time. All I got to do is say the name of Jesus and he is right there listening to my prayer. Every time I call on him, I have found him to be close. He always shows up. So let me tell you, this prayer is not about a quota. And it's not about the quantity of time. It's about the quality of time. Whether it's an hour or whether it's a minute, the entire purpose of prayer is that you spend time with Jesus. That's it. And Jensen Franklin penned this, and I like this. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more time you spend in prayer. Amen. That's right. Let me go ahead and, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm just going to go ahead and get ahead of myself. You don't always have to talk to pray. That's right. That's right. That's right. Come on. This whole idea that we've got to talk, 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 talk to pray, nope. that's not it. The Lord said, be still. Amen. And know that I'm. You know what? Be still means shut up. <laughs> That's Drake's unauthorized translation. Shut up. There are times we're to pour our heart out to Him. There are times we're to lay it all at His feet. There are times, Holly, we're to be have the gift of gab. But there's other times, Sister Tracy, we are to sit still and shut up. That's right. Come on. Because prayer is a conversation. That's right. It is not a one-way street. And we have to give him room to talk. Amen. That's right. And having quality time with Jesus is about telling him what's on your heart, but also giving him time to respond. Yes. 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 It's not about the quantity of time. It's about the quality of time. As long as you are spending time with Jesus, you are spending time in prayer. Amen. Successful prayer is not about a time quota. Second thing is, successful prayer is not determined by your words. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7, When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. There are people who think the more they talk, the more they'll get from God. They think if I talk more and if I say more, then I will get a better audience with the king and he will give me more. But can I tell you, I don't find that to be true in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture do you find many lengthy prayers, but every time in Scripture somebody prayed, it was a short prayer, and that short prayer accomplished great results. Elijah prayed a 63-word prayer, and fire fell from heaven. Hezekiah prayed a 28-word prayer, and God extended his life 15 years. Joshua simply said, Son, stand still, and it did. Blind Bartimaeus just said, Lord, I want to see, and God gave him his sight. Peter, when he was drowning said, Jesus, save me. And the Lord lifted him up out of the water. The ten lepers just cried, Lord, have mercy on us. And he healed them. The thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me. And he went into the kingdom. You don't have to pray some long discourse of prayer. All you got to do is call on his name and he will hear you. Romans says, for whoever calls 
on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All you got to do is shout the name of Jesus and he will come to your aid. Somebody give him praise this morning. Huh. All you got to do is call. All you got to do is ask him. All you got to do is call on his name and he'll answer. But the problem is we complicate things. We make prayer harder than it should be. We tether ourselves to these religious rituals and these lies and we convince ourselves that prayer is too hard so we don't do it at all. See, the disciples had this same issue. They were taught from very early on. No matter what vocation they were in, they were all Jewish boys. Okay? And from the time of little bitty, but even especially at 13, Brother Chris, they were taught how to pray. Go read about the Jewish culture. They start some of their children, and, and, I, and I think this is very, very good, and I think we should all do this. As soon as children are able to listen to us read and understand words, at the, even at the young age of three, they start reading them the Torah so that by the time they are adults, they know the Torah from front to back. And they teach them how to pray. So these men knew how to pray, but their prayer life was unfruitful. And when Jesus came along, they saw that his prayer life accomplished great things. The difference between their prayer and his is his prayer brought results. When he prayed, dead men rose out of their grave. When he prayed, God was able to take five loaves and two fishes and feed over 5,000 people. When Jesus prayed, the storm stood still and the waves stopped roaring. Every time Jesus prayed, something great happened. And they wanted to know, Sister Lucy, what's the difference in his prayer and our prayer? What makes him different? So one day they asked him, and we went over this in the Lord's Prayer series. They just came to him one day when he was praying. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And basically they were saying, Lord, show us what it takes. Lord, show us what's special about your prayer. Lord, show us how your prayer life is different from ours. Now, if Jesus had been concerned with the amount of time that it takes us to pray, and if he had been concerned with the amount of words we use, he would have said, just talk, 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 talk. Just say, 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 say. Just, just, just gab, 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 gab. Just say something even when you don't have nothing to say at all. Just fill the time. Make sure you pray this amount of time and say this amount of words. But he didn't tell them that. No, if you will read the rest of it in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew chapter 6, when they said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. It was a 68-word prayer that takes all of a minute to recite. And I can just imagine Brother Chris, when he finished teaching them, they were going, Amen. Are you serious? Amen. That's all it takes? Jesus said, yeah, that's all it takes. What he was teaching them and what he's teaching us. It does not require spiritual calisthenics to get a prayer through. It does not require us to jump through some religious hoops. All we got to do is go to the Father and ask. Because he said, your Father has need, knows what you have need of before you even ask him. Before you even acknowledge it. Our God knows what you need and he's able to supply your need. So when you go and pray... Don't beat around the bush. Don't try and work something up. Don't just go around the issue. Get straight to business. Talk to the Father. Tell Him what you need. Acknowledge your problem. Because when you acknowledge it, He's going to intervene and He's going to answer and fulfill what you need. Yes. It has nothing to do with the amount of time and the amount of words we use. All we got to do is call on Him. And when we call, he will answer. See, prayer is not a hardship. It's not difficult. We've got to destroy these lies and stop telling ourselves that we're not good at prayer. I've heard of people, when they, people get intimidated to pray around me. I don't know why. I am no expert at prayer. 
But I, I can't pray around you. I'm not good at prayer. I'm just not deep like you are. You may tell you why you're not good at prayer and why you're not deep is because you don't pray. Amen. Amen. There you go. You ever heard the, my daddy was a football coach, baseball coach. He coached everything but soccer and underwater basket weaving, okay? And so I heard it every time I was in sports. Practice makes perfect. I see it. That's good. And as much as I hated that phrase when we were in sports, I found it to be true. That's right. If I want to be good at prayer, guess what I got to do? I got to keep praying. That's right. That's right. If I want to get deep into the Word, I've got to pray. If I want to be a deep person, I've got to pray. Yes. Sister Teresa, I remember when I first, well, this really wasn't that long ago, but I remember there'd be times I'd listen to preachers and I'd beat myself up. I'd listen to these great men, and I would think, why can't I be anointed like that? I'd hear them talk about dreams and visions, and I'd think, why can't I hear from God like that? I, I, they, would, they, would, they would pull out this deep truth of the Word, and it would just preach, and it would be so powerful and so profound. And Sister Sandy, I'd think, why am I not good like that? And one day, I was sitting there nursing my insecurities, beating myself up, wallering. And Sister Betty, I felt the Lord just speak so softly. He said, you can do and have everything they have if you'll just pay the price. Oh, there it is. And I thought, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, you want to know what makes the difference between them and you? What is it, Lord? They have intimacy with me. There you go. Come on. I had, I had to be honest with myself, Sister Rosemary. At that time in my life, I didn't have a prayer life. Yep. I thought I could accomplish what I was doing simply on charisma and gifting. Yep. Come on. I'm being transparent and honest with you. Yes, yep. I thought if I can just talk good, if I can scream, if I can sweat, if I can do all that, it'll be good. But I realized there was something missing. I wanted to be deep, and the Lord said, you can be deep if you'll learn to pray. There you go. See, God wants to do more in your life. He wants to give us spiritual gifts. He wants to give us blessings. He wants to let us go into the deep things of God. But can I tell you that He's not going to give you those things without you first pursuing Him. Amen. Amen to that. He's not, let me just, I know I've said this, but I just, I feel like i got to say it again. He's not going to bless this church until we pursue Him first. If our pursuit is about growth, we've lost our priority. He said, on this rock I will build my church. Guess what? The church is His. It's His responsibility to build it. We just do our part and seek Him and everything else falls into place. God wants to bless your life. He wants to give you those things. But you got to pursue Him first. Right. You want to know why you got to pursue Him first? It's because if you don't pursue Him first, you'll think it has something to do with you. Mm -hmm. yes. Come on. Yes, amen. Come on. You're right. Let me tell you, yes. you may tell you why sometimes churches don't grow. It's because they make it all about the preacher. Amen. Come on. I see it. You're right. Come on. They make it all about the man of God. And that's great that they honor the man of God. But that man of God is not God. That's amen. right. Amen. He is fallible. If you think I'm perfect, please come spend a Monday with me. <laughs> you will find tomorrow he is just as fleshly as I am, okay? Because on Mondays I am not in the best mood, okay? <laughs> they build it off of a personality. You can't build a church off of a personality. You can't build a church off of a denomination. That's right. Amen. You have to build it on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and resurrected, ascending, and coming back. Amen. You have to pursue Him before everything. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What then? If he was to do the then before the seeking, you would think it had something to do with you. Yes, you're right. Come on. You got to seek him first. When you seek him first, everything else comes into place. And you will find that God will do more in your life if you will learn to pray. See, you, if you want to be deep, if you want to get in tune with God, if you want to experience more of God, just pray. Amen. I saved you several thousand dollars on growth seminars and seminars from all these televangelists that'll tell you, let me teach you how to be more spiritual. I'll tell you for free, pray. Amen. Pray. Amen. You want to walk around in the anointing that the early church had? Pray. 
You want to walk around and experience answered prayers? Pray. Pray. Be a man or woman of prayer. Just talk to Him. See, I think it's funny how when we approach prayer, we try to pretend to be somebody that we're not. You ever met those people? You ask them to pray at the family get-together. And some people really pray like, like this, so I'm not making fun of them, but I've seen people that don't. Our most heavenly, gracious potentate. The lily of the valley. The bride and the morning star. Oh, we give us thee thanks, oh, heavenly master. Oh, you are high and lifted up above all the heavens and the earth. The firmament is your foot. You've heard people pray like that, okay? If that's how you pray, pray. But if not, don't fake it. Amen. You're not fooling him. Amen. You don't have to sound deep to be deep. Amen. You don't have to sound to You want to know how I talk to God? Exactly how I talk to you. Amen. I'll be honest with you. Can I just be honest? I know what time it is. I'm going to, y'all going to get out early today. <laughs> this morning, I'm just going to be totally transparent with you. I was not in the best mood. I didn't feel good. And I said, Betty, I said, Lord, I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to go. I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to sweat and holler. I don't want to get hot. I, I, I'm, I'm tired. My, my, my throat hurts because I hadn't taken my medicine. And Lord, I just, I just don't want to go. And Lord, I just need you to help me get rid of this attitude. Uh-huh. That's how I talk to him. That's right. Lord, there's sometimes I'll be riding down the road and Taylor have a bad day and I'll just hit my hands on the steering wheel. God, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't get it. I need you to do something. Yes, amen. Come on. If you think, now, I, now don't get me wrong. We need to honor the Lord and respect his position. Amen. Yes. Amen. But he don't require you to know every Jewish name, every Hebrew name, every Greek name in order to approach him. All you got to do is call him daddy. Amen. All you got to do is call him Father. All you got to do is say Lord. All you got to do is say the name of Jesus and he bends down his ear and he starts listening to his son or to his yes. daughter. Yes. Yes, he does. You don't have to be, you don't have to sound a certain way. All you got to do is cry out. Psalm 34 and 6 said this poor man cried out and what? The Lord heard him. All you got to do is cry out Father and He's right there to deliver you. All you got to do is cry out, Jesus! And He's right there in the midst of you. All you got to do is whisper His name and the very presence of God will show up where you are. All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is call on Him. Just learn to pray. You don't have to sound a certain way. You don't have to sound pious. You don't have to use certain religious vernacular. You don't even have to sound Pentecostal. You don't have to go and beat your prayer, prayer room. You don't have to go and scream and holler and shake and shimmy and woo to get a hold of God. No, all you got to do is come to Him with a sincere heart because a broken and a contrite heart He will not deny. If you'll come to Him with a real need, He will hear your prayer and answer you. The only requirement God has for answering your prayers for you to ask. That's it. He said in Matthew 7, 7 through 8, Ask and what? It shall be given. For whoever asks, receives. That's it. He didn't say you got to ask and you got to go do this and got to do this and you got to sound like this. You got to do this. You got to jump through. The, no, he said, if you'll just ask, if you'll just call on me, if you'll just tell me what you need, you will receive what you ask for. It's time to stop complicating prayer and start going to him with sincerity and with transparency and just kneeling before him and saying Jesus this is what I need and I know you can do it. You All you got to do is call on him and ask. Yes. Yes. Are you hearing me this morning? Yes. Yes. That's the only requirement God has to answer your prayer. You want to learn how to get a prayer through? Just ask him. Just ask him. 
All you got to do is ask. Misty, come on. Leonard Ravenhill said, Prayerlessness is disobedience. For God's command is that men are always to pray and not faint. To be prayerless is to fail God. For He says, Ask of me. You want to know one surefire way to keep God from intervening into your situation? Don't ask Him. You want to know one good surefire way not to get a prayer answered? Don't pray. Because the only way you can fail at prayer is to not pray. I know this is simple, but I feel, I know for me, this was a reality and a truth I had to grasp because I spent years avoiding prayer because I made it difficult. It was a chore. It was something I had to do if I wanted to be successful. No, this morning when I was in my office praying, I said, Lord, I thank you that prayer is not a chore, but it is a, it's not a requirement, but it is a privilege. Amen. Because we could be the Old Testament. Yeah. You know how they had to get a prayer from God? They went, and if they had the money, they went and got them a lamb. They brought the lamb to the priest. The priest had to go through a ritual that took probably an hour to an hour and a half, had to apply the blood, and then after, if they were good, if they were on good terms, they could get a prayer through. We don't have to do that anymore. Because the perfect lamb of God shed his blood on Calvary over 2,000 years ago, and it said that he bridged the separation between man and God. And because he applied the blood to the heavenly throne room, to the heavenly prayer altar, we can now come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. I'm thankful that we have prayer. Because if it wasn't for prayer, he wouldn't be able to intervene. I know this is simple, but I wanted to help you understand. You don't have to make prayer hard. It's you who makes prayer hard, not God. Because all he said was ask. That's it. That's it. Just ask. Prayer is not a hardship. It's not something that we have to dread. All we got to do is sit with Him, call on Him, and we're in prayer. Here's what I want you to understand about prayer. It's not a hardship. It's not difficult. We need to look at prayer for what it really is. And here's what prayer really is. I'm going to talk about some other things in a couple of weeks. But here's what prayer at the base, most simple foundation, most simple definition. Prayer is a line of sincere communication with the Heavenly Father. That's all it is. It's coming to Him sincerely and humbly and confessing you have a need. And He needs to meet that need for you. I want you to stand with me this morning. When you simply ask, you make room for God to work. We want God to do more in our lives. We've got to make room for Him. And the way we make room for Him is by prayer. Here's our challenge. For This is my altar call. I want you to commit this week to make room for God by praying. Here's what you do. You set aside intentional time to pray. And don't set a time limit. Don't tell yourself, I got to pray 15 minutes just like I read my word. If that's what you want to do, fine. Do it. But don't look at the clock. Don't get so caught up in a time allotment. And don't condemn yourself if all you can pray is a minute. Because even if it's a minute, He still heard you. Even if it's 30 seconds, He still heard you. Just spend time with Him. And when you spend time with Him, don't try to work something up. Don't try to be somebody you're not. If you're not a hot, I'll be honest with you. I pray just like I preach. When I get to worked up, when I get worked up, you can hear me in there hitting on my my, my desk. You can hear me in there shouting. If you come in there, I might be dancing. You never know what you might see of me. But that's my personality. My wife's personality is totally different. When she prays, she cries. That's it. And sometimes she can't speak because all she can do is choke back tears. 
But can I tell you, he hears her prayer just like he hears mine. Because his word says that our prayers go up before him as an incense and he has our tears written down in a book. No matter... Mm, I got to do this before we end this. Do you know how many ways there are to pray? You can speak. And I'm hurrying, but I feel the Holy Ghost. You can ask Him vocally. You can speak it to Him. Sometimes the, all you got to do is cry. Because it said that our tears are numbered. Our tears are written down in his book of remembrance. And Paul said in Romans chapter 8, sometimes we don't have the words to even whisper something. And it said that the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now some people think that that means we pray in tongues. No, the word groanings means, the, it means actually birth pangs. It's actually a woman giving birth. And you've heard some women giving birth, men. You heard how they scream and they just, oh, oh, God. He, that's just as much prayer as me talking to him. And then sometimes we pray in the spirit and then sometimes we just stand still. That's right. Don't limit yourself to think you've got to pray a certain way. Pray according to who you are. Because no matter how you pray, he'll hear you. Amen. So my challenge to you this week is pray how you pray. Don't try to be fake. Don't try to work something up. Just speak from your heart. And you may tell you, you may tell you when you know you're done praying, when you feel like you've got it all out. Prayer is the best counseling session some of us could ever have. Just pour it out. Lay it at his feet because he can handle it. You can't shoulder it anymore. Learn to just spew it out. And when you feel like you've laid it all out, then you're done with prayer. So here's what I want to challenge. I want to ask you just like I did last week. How many of you will commit this week to making time to pray? We're going to make room for God through prayer this week. Amen. I want you to keep those hands lifted. And I want us to make this a sign of surrender and say, Lord, help me to pray this week and teach me, Lord, how to get a hold of you. Father, I thank you for the word this morning. I thank you, Lord, that all we got to do to be successful at prayer is ask. All we've got to do is approach your throne. All we've got to do is whisper your name and you are there. God, this week I pray that you would help us dispel the lie that prayer is a hardship, that prayer is difficult and impossible. Lord, prayer is not hard. It's only hard if we make it hard. Lord, help us experience the flow of prayer this week. And God, when we pray, when these men and women commit to going to the Lord in prayer, I pray that God, you will intervene and interject your presence and that God, they will find you to be close. God, this, this morning, help your people to pray and help us to make room for you as we seek you through prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. I love you. Taylor loves you. She sends her love. She hates she couldn't be here this morning. I pray that you will find this week to be fruitful. And that in your time and your word and in your prayer, God will reveal himself to you. Amen. Love on somebody as you're dismissed this morning. We hope you have a wonderful and blessed week.